G'day Dave here and we're looking at James chapter 4 and verses 1 to 3. What is it that causes fights and quarrels among you? Well I've been asked that more than once. Uh, when I was younger and I was living with my parents and my little sister and my younger brother, there'd be many a time when our parents would come to us as kids and say, who has caused this fight? Uh, what's going on? And we would all point the finger at the other. It's not my fault. I didn't do it. They should apologize. They took my toy. They were rude. It was them that was uh, speaking badly about me. It's them that did this and they need to apologize. No, it's not my fault. It's their fault. And so the conflict would continue. And uh, it's not just a children problem though, is it? I find that it's still a problem that we battle with today. Uh, there's a conflict perhaps in, in a family, maybe a husband and wife arguing with each other and they're thinking they're not listening. They need to take responsibility for their actions, for their words. They don't understand me. They're not trying to understand me. I've said that a dozen times. It's up to them. They should apologize. And you see, it's very easy to point the finger. Or it might be a problem at work. If only my boss understood things a little bit better. If only he wasn't so demanding. Or it might be a problem at church. If only people weren't so clicky. If only they'd kind of realize that they're isolating and separating themselves from others. If only they'd realize how difficult it was to break into relationships. If only they'd realize the hurt that they caused with the things that they said. If only, if only, if only. And friends, we've got absolutely no control over what others do. But we do have control over what we say and what we do. And you see, James makes it clear and he reminds us, and he's done this a few times already, that what comes out of us is a revelation of what's going on inside us. And so if we find ourselves in conflicts, in squabbling, in fighting, in accusations, in the breakdown of relationships, if we can't get on with each other, we've got to ask, what's going on inside me? Because it's not the external that's the real problem. It's the way we deal with it in our hearts. Now pick it up with me in James chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Here's the problem. It's a heart problem. He says, verse 2, You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel. I mean, the language here, it's, it's pretty extreme, isn't it? Uh, in verse 1, the, the fights and quarrels are literally wars and conflicts. It's, it's seriously blown up language here. This isn't simply some argument between people. This is warfare that's going on. You think, what kind of a church is this? And then you read a little bit further down, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. So there's murder going on in this church. No, Jesus made it clear that you don't actually have to kill somebody to murder them. It, it can be the attitude of the heart. And you may be just hostile, angry, treating them as a fool, despising people, and you've effectively killed them. You see, the problem is a heart problem. And it bubbles out and it destroys our relationships with each other. You covet, that is, you want what they've got, but you can't get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight about it. How much of the conflict comes from this idea that there's limited resources and we've just got to fight each other to get them. We want what they've got. We're jealous of what they have. It's a problem of our greed, our envy, our, our desire for power and recognition, our desire for status. Quite possibly the fights are over things at times. A limited property, maybe, resources, uh, dollars in the budget, opportunity to do things. What we see going on here in James isn't Christians rejoicing with those who rejoice. This is Christians saying, how come I miss out? And then fighting and squabbling about it. I want what she's got, what he's got. And we don't get it, so we fight. And James tells us it's a heart problem. It's a failure fundamentally to trust in God, God who promises to meet our needs. And he continues by making this clear. Look at the last part of verse 2. You do not have because you do not ask God. So the fundamental problem when we feel that we need things that we don't have, maybe that others do have, is that we leave God out of the picture altogether. We don't trust him. We ignore him. We just try and get for ourselves and that brings us into conflict. And James, the word of God, tells us we need to recognize that God is the provider and come to him for what we need, to trust him 
with our needs. And, and we think the way ahead is so often just to put ourselves forward and, and to, to seek after, to grab hold of what we really want. But friends, you only need two to think like that and you've got conflict. If we fail to go to God to meet our needs and we demand that our needs be met by others, then you're going to have warfare. It's the way it works. Breakdown of relationship, marriage breakdown, splits in churches, wars between countries, they all end up being ultimately a problem of our heart. Our heart that demands what we want at the expense of others. And friends, when we're in need, when we're in genuine need, not just greed, but need, then we ought to pray. We ought to ask God. And that's what he says here. When you need, you should ask God. And uh, so often, I think we push God right out of the picture. When there's envy and when there's greed taking hold of our hearts, we forget that God's the provider and we just want what others have got. Now, friends, it's a problem. It's selfish. Uh, and indeed, sometimes when we do remember to pray, it's just as selfish. Look at what he says in verse 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Um, prayer won't get answered. At least it won't get answered the way we want when our prayers are selfish. It reminds me of uh, a song. Uh, I don't know who wrote it, but Janis Joplin sang it. It went like this. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. You must make amends. I've worked hard all my lifetime with no help from my friends. So, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? <laughs> and I wonder how many of our prayers are like that. They're, they're not ultimately prayers for what we need. They're prayers for what we're envying in others. Well, when God doesn't give us what we want, maybe it's because he knows what we truly need. And we should thank him. So next time you're involved in conflict, here's a strategy. Why not stop? Just slow down, pause. And instead of thinking about what they've brought to the conflict, think about yourself. Where, where's your heart at? What am I thinking? What, what's going on inside me? What am I most concerned with here? Am I most concerned with myself? Am I most concerned to get this stuff? Am I most concerned for, for what I want? For winning an argument even? Or am I more concerned for them, out of love for them, concern for the other? Friends, our heart problem will lead us into conflict again and again and again. And so I take it that we should stop and we should pray that God will help us to see ourselves as we are. That he'll bring us to a point of humility. That he'll give us the true wisdom that understands that God will meet our needs. And all he wants us to do is to ask. And when we do ask, let's ask desiring God to give us what he knows we need and not simply what we want. You see, conflict has to do with seeing ourselves without God's wisdom as more important than those around about us. And that's foolish. And that's dangerous. Friends, let's ask that God will transform our hearts so that we come to him as our God, our Father and Provider, and so that we treat our neighbour as ourselves, concerned for their welfare and not simply our own.